uh, our first talk is by William Lee Powell, Jr., so, uh, studying variable stars with undergraduate students at the University of Nebraska, uh, Kearney. I mean, I've always studied variable stars with a telescope, so I guess I'm going to learn something new. Well, we're right. It's uh, which end do you point up for the undergrads? I don't know. But um, like you said, I am uh, Lee Powell. I'm at uh, University of Nebraska Kearney. Uh, <laughs> Just make that quick correction. Um, yeah, and so I, it's an undergrad-only institution, so I do work heavily with undergrads uh, as a rule. That's, those are the students I work with. Um, so I'm, I'm an assistant professor there and the planetarium director and whatever else they tell me to do uh, as I go through. So again, outline real quick. I'm going to uh, start off talking a little bit about working with undergrads in general. Just uh, a lot of us do it, so I'm probably preaching to the choir anyway. But uh, talk a little bit about sort of the challenges and the rewards that come with working with undergrads, and then uh, kind of go through a, a arc here of projects I've been working on. Uh, specific, you know, the RLI tie-in here for the pulsating theme, uh, how that took me back into binary stars, which actually, truth be told, when I started my undergraduate, I went to Stephen F. Austin. I, I worked with Norm Markworth there, who was a student of Wilson, uh, and using photoelectric photometers to do um, binary star work is where I got got my start back as an undergraduate. So it's interesting to, to sort of have this project lead me back into binary stars and then my sort of current work playing particularly with the O'Connell effect. Um, first, I do want to talk a little bit about UNK uh, and what's going on there. Um, it's kind of a new era for astronomy in general uh, at UNK. We are now the place to do an astronomy major uh, in the state of Nebraska. The last folks retired at the main university, uh, and so we're it. So I, I came in thinking maybe adding a minor, and it turned out, uh, due to weird politics internally, it turned out a lot easier to make two astronomy majors rather than a minor. So I, I added two tracks there, one of which is essentially our track for which physics majors are going to grad school. And just pulled out a few needless courses like solid state and things like that that only those physicists care about and replaced them with useful things like astrophysics one and two and then two methods classes actually. So we did two sort of knowing and two sort of doing uh, classes. So me methods one is a computational, um, whether it's uh, end body simulations for a analysis, SQL, data mining, whatever. And the second half is more your traditional observational astronomy class. Um, so we're about it now. Uh, at this point, we're adding two new faculty uh, for the fall that were completely new lines in engineering, uh, bringing the department to nine. Uh, but at this point, as of next year, four of our nine are astronomers. Um, it's kind of an interesting story. There are a cautionary tale for physicists. Two years ago, they put me in charge of the search, um, and we had two open positions. And I had just pushed through the new major. So I said, well, we really need, we have one astronomer getting ready to retire. Let's, let me have a second so that I can offer the major. And it turned out that the best two candidates both happened to be astronomers. So we hired Dr. Jensen away from Lincoln. I must say he was visiting, or a, a lecturer there, and we hired him away. He works on exoplanets, particularly uh, transmission spectroscopy of uh, atmospheres on exoplanets is his main focus. Uh, and Mariana Lazarova, who does active galactic nuclei, uh, came in with us. And then this year we had, again, two searches. And they put uh, the committee for the physics side of the house was Powell, Lazarova, and Jensen. The three astronomers were placed in charge of the search, not having learned for their lesson from the first time. And we only hired one, to be fair. But uh, Joel is joining us in the fall, he actually does computational uh, work on galaxy formation and cosmology. Um, so at this point, that's that's the, <laughs> the rapid change in our department. Um, as I uh, as I say here, I've been working. I tried an MRI last year. Uh, anybody who's been trying through the National Science Foundation for major research instrumentation knows there, there's not much money and there's a lot of requests. There was over 15 million in requests, and they funded less than 1.5 million, or right at 1.5. So uh, it was a resounding no last time, and uh, we tried again this year. We got the price down, and we're an EPSCOR state and a primarily undergraduate institution, so we're hopeful that maybe we'll be adding something in the dark skies there in central Nebraska. Um, so challenges working with undergrads. Time is the biggest. You don't have them. You can't hold them hostage like you do a PhD student. <laughs> 
you get a, do a doctoral student, you may have them for four to 12 years, depending on the department you're in. Um, that's more difficult with undergrads because they can't keep their scholarships if you start pushing them in year five or six. Um, so uh, the current undergrad, his poster at the back there, I, I picked him up. I taught the freshman physics lab, so I got him first semester, first year, and got him started on some basic stuff and had him observing by the summer of his first year. Uh, but even then, you know, they're busy. They got 27 million things going on, and, and it's hard for them to do it. So you have to teach them all of the background. Um, now, that's the other drawback of having this many astronomers, too. There's also a lot of folks trying to recruit them away to work in their lab instead of yours. So, um, so you get them trained up, and then they go work with somebody else. So time in general, you have to uh, find small, bite-sized chunks for them to work on because you're not going to keep them that long. As it turns out, Austin's really up to speed, and I've completely convinced him that variable stars is the only kind of astronomy to do. Um, maybe somebody will, <laughs> will fix him. I don't know. But that's where I've got him, I've got him steered right now. Um, so um, you have to use little mini projects that they can take ownership. Uh, that's really important at an undergrad institution with a project like this, just from a retention standpoint. If you can get them to take ownership of it, they're more likely to persist in the physics major or the astronomy major overall. They're more likely to persist in the field when they go on, just because they have that experience. If nothing else, they become, in the astronomy case, lifelong hobbyists. You know, you can get them interested in continuing one way or the other. And in general, turn out more competitive graduates. Our graduate this year, this is a big time of change for the university in general. This was a teaching college forever. That's what they had been doing. At this point, I said we're going to be up to nine. The most senior of those is my chair, who was hired uh, seven years ago. So at this point, he's the only ranked or tenured person in our department left out of the nine of us. Um, so it's been a massive overturn, and we've gone from essentially all education majors to getting people that want to go into grad school. Our senior this year did very well. He only got turned down by one grad school. He applied to like eight, and Urbana-Champaign is the only one who told me no. So um, he just took the major field test, and I think scored 98th percentile this year. So we've focused it on, uh, on getting the rigor up, and that's we've been successful in that focus doing that. So, uh, But research is a big part of that. He's been doing REUs or research in our labs from the start, and that's, that's a theme we keep for all of our majors in general. Uh, so lots of words. Don't worry about reading it. Uh, over the last eight years, I've had nine undergrads go to McDonald Observatory with me, doing a total of uh, 55 nights on site uh, and up to 18 just this last year now that the 30 inches operated remotely. So most of that's variable stars work, uh, okay, a little bit on globular cluster tidal streams, but almost everything else is variable stars. Um, so those have presented at regional or national meetings. So the, I, uh, it's a big focus in the department. So my current projects fall into basically three categories. Uh, poorly studied binary stars in general is kind of where we've gone now, ones that people may know what the type is, but not much else. Um, particularly ones that um, exhibit the O'Connell effect is, is kind of in the focus. Um, so again, I took three students down there last year, two of them were freshmen, one of them was a sophomore, so all very early in their career. Uh, to use the 30-inch and 82-inch simultaneously to do uh, photometry and spectroscopy in, in real time on both uh, objects. Uh, we're turning around and going, uh, Austin's going with me again this summer for uh, additional work, and I'll come back to that. Uh, tidal streams uh, uh, around globular star clusters, particularly a couple, I have a recent grad who's uh, didn't leave town, and she's uh, very interested in computational stuff, so she's working on building up some uh, searches through Sloan Digital Sky Survey for tidal streams and doing in-body simulations of what do you expect for these kind of objects in general. So uh, not a very active field for me right now, but it's one of, it's kind of one of the places my heart is for, for going back to do that. Uh, and I'll, I'll actually kind of do this reverse order because this is where I'm going to start, uh, is detecting RLIRIs in large surveys. Um, so we've had plenty on RLIRIs. I don't need to, to talk about it. We have the uh, the popular picture there where just about all the party lights going on in this cluster are RR Lyries or other uh, pulsating variable stars in particular. Um, in particular, though, what, what my group did during my graduate work, uh, my advisor was working on the Blue Star Spectra calibration pipeline for the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. So Ron Wilhelm was Tim Beers' student, uh, and, and that was kind of his focus. Um, and in particular, what he did was 
look at the garbage ones, the ones that don't fit the model, and just throw them into a bin that we could come back to later. So uh, regular stars should be between these, these red lines here. So we looked at the ones that are don't make sense from an astrophysical standpoint uh, and used those then uh, combined with Stripe 82 where they went back and observed over and over again and you could identify which were variable stars to find two of them where the instability strip is and how do you actually identify those. Uh, and based on that, our prediction using Stripe 82 was 85% of these candidate objects turn actually out to be RLI. Um, and the nice thing is this is based on a single epic of photometry and a single epic of spectrum. And the key thing here is that those, since they were just taken at random in Sloan, they, they weren't necessarily taken at the same point of phase. They were taken at different points in the pulsation. So there, we get the ones that were at different points in pulsation, so the summer line don't agree with the observed temperatures. Uh, and that's, that's the problem with the model fit. That's why they get kicked out as, as weird in the first place. I've been doing follow-up because it's very easy to go and use the 30-inch to do follow-up of these candidates and even do 10 of them a night and just pick up one every hour or two because you can very readily see when it's a, uh, an RLI read that, that it is variable uh, just from that kind of data. And at this point, we're running about 93% of the ones that we have observed, which is something like 25 at this point, have turned out to be variable. Um, 87% are clearly RLI reads, either, either uh, A, B, or C types. Uh, and then there's some others that are weird that could be either double mode or some, something else, that's stuck, whether it was a binary star or something stuck in there. Um, most of those I haven't followed up, but some I have. Um, but the nice thing is they're all very manageable smaller telescopes, and the learning curve to be able to do this kind of work for undergrads is very, very low. Um, so uh, at this point, I've had undergrads observe these suspected RLI re, see if they're variable. Uh, on the confirmed ones, we've been try to, trying to go back and do follow-up observations as time permits uh, if we don't get pulled off in other directions <laughs> like I have been. So uh, just recently, AVSO uh, was gracious enough. We published a paper through there. Uh, uh, Stephanie, uh, it was an undergrad who did most of these observations with me, um, graduated before she wrote it up, um, and of course Nathan and, and Ron. Nathan was a visiting at the time on this project, and Ron was my advisor, so he was uh, involved certainly in the selection of this. Incidentally, he's never gone back, and the paper got rejected the first time, or asked, you know, we had a referee report, and, and eight years later he still had <laughs> resubmitted, so there is a an archive of it, but... Uh, He's never actually finished the full paper on this. So. Um, so this is one of the ones that we picked up in there, and you can see the fit. Of course, they're faint. You know, it's, it's Sloan's. So they're, they're fainter than fifth, 15th magnitude for the most part. Uh, some of the ones we have go down to 20th magnitude. So their outer halo, most of them are unidentified, you know, previously unknown our libraries, and their field are our libraries, not cluster. You know, they're out in the middle of nowhere. Um, so... Um, Based on that, as I said, I went back and did follow-ups of these. One of those that was in that paper, we had eight nights of total observations on. Uh, not wanting to waste all those pixels, I, uh, I had a student go through and look for variable sources in the field of that uh, particular RLRE, and one of them was very clearly uh, a variable source. And it looked at first, he thought it was an RRC. But as we started looking a little closer at the light curve, this is, was his first kind of plot he threw together there, you see a the asymmetry and the overall shape between the max and min, it, it clearly wasn't an RRC, but instead looks like a contact binary exhibiting at least a faint version of the O'Connell effect, which is an asymmetry in the light curve, presumably due to spots, um, though I think that's unclear exactly the cause. Uh, at least, you know, we have accepted views, but, but final definitive answers are lacking on some of this. So, um, at this point, then, he, uh, I had a, the undergrad pick this up. He used Binary Maker 3 to play with finding the best solutions uh, that fit this for temperature, mass, et cetera. Vayu, uh, my, my collaborator here, helped with uh, fitting the asymmetry of the light curve and determining the O'Connell effect for this. And uh, so that's, that's now been submitted. We're waiting on a referee report. We made the corrections the first time and uh, or made some modifications, and it's back in. So. Um, hopefully this will be accepted. Actually, Austin's an undergrad, my current undergrad, and Gage is an undergrad at Truman State. So this is, again, using heavily. Uh, and again, continuing on this, at this point, we're expanding to try to target binary stars that exhibit the O'Connell effect for long-term 
follow-up observations. We're going to get spectroscopy to be able to nail down the orbital parameters of what's going on in these stars and then do long-term observations of these to see the degree to which the O'Connell effect strengthens and weakens over time um, and, and be able to, to tell definitively over the course of a few years how, how is this effect coming and going, changing, is it likely to be due to spots, is it hot spots, is it cool spots, what's, what's going on there. So I've got 20 nights more this summer, 13 remote and 7 on site coming for McDonald uh, to work on this. So that's, that's just kind of continuing. You saw his poster back there. Uh, Austin's working with me this summer on what we call a summer uh, student research project uh, funded by the undergrad research office on campus. Um, he has to turn in a paper at the end of this to the committee. Uh, I told him just to go ahead and format it for submission to the AADSO because at his, his project we're just going to submit. It'll be a first office paper for him. So he's going to pick up one or two of these stars and hammer on it just on his own. At this point, he can almost do it without me, but I'll make him put me on the paper. But uh, but he could almost do it without me at this point. So uh, so that's all all coming along. So that's that's kind of what we're doing at this point is analyzing those guys, uh, trying to get baselines for the O'Connell effect, and move on from there. So I'll leave it there and see if we have questions. I want to make sure we have time for that. So. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello. Thank you very much. Thanks. Questions? Anyone have questions? No questions about I, I have nature. I have one question. What do you do about the millennials? Oh. <laughs> you know, uh, they can be interested in objects if you if you Try to spin it to make it cool enough, I guess. You know, tell them it's disco lights. I don't know. Uh, no, they, he's uh, Austin's worked really hard on this. He likes, again, I think the ownership aspect of it is important. If they, if they feel like it's just something to help somebody, you know, as part of a big project versus this is my project makes a difference with motivating undergrads at this point. So I'm, I'm trying to make it his star that he's going to do from start to finish this summer. So. Uh, other questions? Okay. No. I disappeared anyway. So good thing nobody asked that. All right. All right. Thank you very much.